Welcome everyone to our 2021 K-State Garden Hour Fall Series. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you are a regular, um, welcome back and we're happy to have you joining us again. So this webinar series began in spring of 2020 as I hope to share extension gardening education during the height of the pandemic. With much success, we've reached over 10,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Cassie Homan and I'm the horticulture agent in the Post Rock District. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, but most of all, we each have a love for educating others and sharing important gardening topics. I love how this series has been a great way to connect gardeners from all across the state of Kansas. So before we get started today, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. This is where we will look for questions during our Q&A session. You should see a, bottom along, a button along the bottom of um, your screen that says Q&A and just click on that and we'll be able to enter um, your questions that way. Our moderators today are Brooke Garcia and Jason Graves. They will be sharing information through the chat during the presentation. And then they will also help facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will post it to our K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to that topic as well. So if we share any links over the chat, um, that will go straight to our website. So our website is where you will have access to previous topics as well. So also the upcoming topics for the 2021 series. So our moderators will go ahead and put that link in the chat. So today's topic is gardening with beneficial insects. I'm pleased to announce our speaker today is Pam Paulson. She is the horticulture agent in Reno County. She's going to teach us how to identify beneficial insects as well as how to attract them to our garden and keep them there. So if you'll give us a few moments while we transition and share the presentation slides. Okay. Thank you, Cassie, and, and welcome everybody to the K-State Garden Hour. Um, at the start, you should have seen a poll, and I hope you will take the time to answer those questions on the poll because that just gives us an idea um, how well we're getting our information across and, and the interest that, that people are showing. But I'm going to go ahead and get started. Like Cassie said, I am Pam Paulson. I'm the horticulture agent in Reno County which is based out of Hutchinson is our, our um, county seat. And we are going to talk about gardening with insects today. And so insects, you know, usually we think of insects as a pest problem, but actually insects do much more good for our gardens than they do harm for us. So the majority of insects, they're not pests, but they have many benefits. One is they will recycle nutrients. Many are um, help us with the composting and, and working through um, the organic matter of, of our, from our gardens. So they will decompose plant and animal waste. And by doing that, they improve the soil quality. Many of our beneficials we know of as pollinators, um, but they also are very good at attacking other crop pests. And then they provide food for wildlife. So if they're um, bird watchers, insects are a great way to attract the birds to your garden as well. So beneficial insects are categorized in, in three different areas. So they're categorized as predators, parasitoids, and pollinators. So the predators, they attack and consume their prey. And so they range in a wide variety of sizes from from microscopic mites that you can't even see to our large praying mantids. Many are generalists, so they feed on a wide variety of insects and they can consume many times their weight in their prey. So some of the common examples are, are ladybugs, lace wings, many of our wasps, spiders, even some of our stink bugs and predatory mites. Our parasitoids often are very tiny and we don't see them working, but, but they're at work for us. They usually live on or inside their prey, 
at the expense of that host, but they don't immediately kill that host because they need that host to continue to live on because they often lay their eggs. And then as those eggs hatch, that larva feeds on that host. So many are specialists, so they will only attack certain specific um, hosts. Many are extremely small, again, difficult to see. Because they are small, they are very susceptible to insecticides. And most of the parasitoids are wasps or flies. And then pollinators, they're the ones that, that help us grow our crops. They move the pollen from one part of a plant to another while they're often feeding on the nectar. So these include flies and hoverflies, beetles, moths and butterflies, solitary bees, bumblebees, and honeybees. So there are a number of beneficial insect friendly practices that you can implement into your garden. So that will ensure that those insects find your garden, but also to help keep them staying there. So the first thing is to learn who the good insects are. So not every insect is, is a pest. So make sure you can tell the difference between the ones that are helping you and the ones that are harming your garden. Many of these other insects, these beneficial insects, they, they need other food sources than just feeding off of insects. So provide food and water sources because they also feed off of nectar and pollen. They get their carbohydrates from the nectar and, and protein from the pollen. And that also attracts the prey that they're feeding on. So provide nesting and overwintering sites. And so when we get into the, the specific beneficial insects, I'll talk a little bit about those nesting and overwintering sites for each species. And then limit your use of insecticides, or if you can use it, target specific insecticides. So um, for example, the army worms that we're having problems with now, they're insecticides that, that only affect um, caterpillars that are in that family. So use something like that rather than an insecticide that will get a wide variety of insects. And then that includes bug zappers as well. And then have some tolerance for plant damage. You know, most of our pests will do some feeding, but they very rarely will take out an entire crop. So if you can, you know, have a little bit of tolerance for damage and maybe plant a little bit extra so you have some of your crop and, and the insects have some as well. One of the ways to, to really um, prevent harming the beneficial insects is to inspect your garden on a regular basis. So look for those insect pests and especially the eggs and control those early. So here you can see a picture of the squash bugs. If you can get them at that stage where they're in the egg stage, you've eliminated most of your problem. Also look for disease plants and then just any other issues going on with, with the garden like dry or wet areas or if there's some sun scorch or wind damage. So learn to know what else is causing damage in your garden besides just insects. And then the main one is to, to know who your pests are. So not all insects are bad. Again, scout for pests frequently. And then again, use the least toxic control methods. So first, if you can um, implement cultural practices, so maybe plants and plants are a little more resistant to, to pests and diseases, and then use um, mechanical means like, you know, picking off the bugs and smushing them rather than, than spraying um, because when you tend to spray, you're not only killing the bad guys, you tend to kill the good guys as well. So again, most plants can sustain a little bit of damage and still produce a good crop. And then again, learn to recognize the damage from diseases and other issues such as overwatering, underwatering, sun scorch, um, and wind damage. So we're going to look at some of our, our beneficial insects. And, and this by all means does not cover all of them, but these are some of the more common ones that you'll probably see in your garden. So these are the ground beetles and they're, they're pretty good sized guys. Usually um, you will see them on a wide variety of plants. So they tend to feed off of caterpillars, aphids, slugs. They tend to feed off of some of the larger insects, but they, because they're ground beetles, they lay their eggs in crevices or in the soil. So one of the things you wanna do is not cover up all of the soil. I know we, we um, tout mulch is a, a great protector for plants and it is right around your plants, but if you can, you know, have a little area maybe that's got some open ground, 
because many of our, our beneficial insects at some stage in their life use the ground for nesting or egg laying. So if there's some open areas that they can use in your yard, that'll help keep them there. So these overwinter in grass clumps or dense woody vegetation, they shelter under mulch, logs, brush piles, and stones. And so again, you wanna leave just a little bit of debris in the winter time to protect these predators. Um, you know, if you've had a pest problem in that area, again, clean up that debris. But if you can have an area where you haven't had pest problems, to leave a little bit of debris for their protection in the winter time. And supplemental food sources for the ground beetles, seeds, pollen, detritus, they're one of the ones that, that help with our, our organic matter. And then several species also feed on weeds, including lamb's quarters and ragweed, which is starting to bloom now. This is the, the Carolina mantis. This is our native mantis. There's also an oriental mantis and those tend to be quite a bit bigger than the Carolina mantis. And then if you look here in the, the bottom left corner is the egg case for the Carolina mantis. And usually when I'm doing my spring cleanup, I run into quite a few of these. The oriental mantis looks similar, but it's more of a, a general blob, not as, as neat as the, the Carolina mantis are. But this is the egg case, and that, that smaller picture there in the inset. And usually they start to hatch late spring, early summer. So when you're cleaning up your garden, don't throw these away or, or get rid of these as you're getting rid of your, of your garden waste. And I'm, I've got this list for all of these insects. I'm not gonna go through each one too closely because many are similar and just for the sake of time, um, but I'll kind of hit some of the highlights. So these, they lay their, their eggs on, on branches. I always find them in my ornamental grasses when I'm getting ready to, to clean that up in the springtime. But that is how they overwinter in those egg cases. And then again, planting supplemental food sources because many of our, our beneficial insects, again, require not just the insects that they feed on, but also that pollen and nectar. Semantids that reside on flowers, they tend to produce more eggs and have larger body mass than those that dwell on non-flowering plants. Our lady beetles, these are, are voracious feeders of some of those smaller insects that we tend to have in our garden. So this is the life cycle of a lady beetle because I often get questions on the larva because that doesn't look anything like that lady beetle. And so people tend to think that that that's a pest problem. But if you see those, that's actually a good, a good insect. So you wanna keep those around. And those larvae actually feed on more um, insects such as aphids and spider mites and thrips than the adults do. And the pupa here can often be mistaken for potato beetle larva. So again, make sure you know which ones you're getting rid of and which ones you're keeping. So the lady beetles, again, they tend to feed on some of those smaller insects like aphids, scales, white flies, and mites, but they also eat many insect eggs. Some of them do tend to overwinter inside buildings, especially if they're light colored buildings. Um, you might find them under the eaves of the house or sometimes they even find their way inside the house. Soldier beetles, there's a wide variety of soldier, beetle, soldier beetles. These are also great pollinators, but they um, also feed on many of our smaller insects like aphids and again, insect eggs as well. These are the lace wings. And every time my milkweed, I get these little orange um, oleander aphids on my milkweed and that those milkweed leaves and those stems just get covered by those aphids. But I know as soon as I see those, I'm going to start seeing the lacewing eggs. And so that top picture on the left, those are the lacewing eggs. They lay their eggs on a stalk because when they hatch, they'll he eat each other. So that, that keeps them separated as they hatch. So if you're starting to see aphids on your plants, start looking for these, these lacewing eggs. And they are also ones that, that eat many of our smaller insects, the aphid thrips, mealybugs, white flies, and again, um, some of the soft bodied insects like caterpillars. These are the minute pirate bugs. Again, these are ones that are very hard to see, but these are ones that 
feed on those smaller insects, but including spider mites. And spider mites are often ones that are some of the hardest to control and can do some of the most damage. Then the assassin bugs, these are some of the larger ones, um, the larger insects that we have. One of my favorites is this bottom right one, the, um, the wheeled assassin bug or the wheel bug. They will eat many of the larger insects, as you can see in some of these pictures. Some of these do have a bite, so you kind of don't want to mess with them um, because that bite is, is pretty powerful. But like I said, larger insects are what they prey on. Caterpillars, aphids, leaf hoppers, even some of the grasshoppers and beetles. So these, their eggs over winter are attached to the plants. And again, under leaf litter and low growing plants and tree bark. These are hoverflies, and these are actual flies instead of bees, even though they look like bees. So they're what's called a bee mimic. And so there are many um, of these bee mimics that, that do benefits in our garden for us. So these, again, smaller insects, aphids, scale, again, the spider mites and thrips. They overwinter, in the, again, the soil and leaf litter, and they shelter in field areas with, with protection from the wind. And then these are the predatory mites. And you usually won't see these unless you've got a magnifying glass or a microscope, but they can be as abundant as our, our harmful mites in our garden. So they will mostly feed on spider mites, but they also feed on other types of mites, thrips, scales, muley bugs, white flies, and even some of the small nematodes. These are predatory wasps. I know we don't always like seeing wasps in our garden because they can often sting, um, but many of our wasps, unless you're actually bothering them, they're going to leave you alone. But they are voracious eaters as well as great pollinators for us. So these will get some of the larger insects, caterpillars, grasshoppers, crickets, beetles, spiders, even tree hoppers, aphids, tree bugs, and flies. Many of these um, overwinter or have their nests, lay their eggs in hollowed out trees or in the ground. And these are some of the parasitoids. These are parasitic wasps and often they're very small so you really don't notice them unless you're looking for them. They tend to be attracted to plants that have smaller flowers but in larger clusters is what will attract them to the nectar and to the pollen. But these, many of these are host specific. And so what they do is they will lay their eggs in a host and those eggs will develop and then that larva hatches and then in turn feeds off of that host. So often they will overwinter in the host wherever those hosts overwinter sites are. These are tachinid flies. And they do the same thing. Um, these are more generalist, so they do not have a specific um, insect host that they will lay their eggs in. And often this is what you see instead of seeing the actual parasitoids themselves. This is a tomato hornworm, and you can see the eggs developing on those on those hornworms. So if you see this, leave it in your garden because that's growing those beneficial insects for us. And then our pollinators. According to the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service, three-fourths of the world's flowering plants and about 35 percent of the world's food crops depend on some kind of animal pollinators to reproduce. Worldwide they're close to 20,000 bee species and in North America we have about 4,000 native bees. Most of our native bees are solitary, and again, our pollinators need protein from the pollen, and then they get their carbohydrates from their nectar. So again, native bees, we've got about 4,000 species in North America, and they're actually better pollinators than the European honeybees, which are not native to, to North America, but they're native to, um, to Europe. One, because they're native and they've kind of evolved with the plants here and the ecosystem here, they 
have fewer diseases than honeybees, where honeybees, because they can be moved around so easily as a colony, they tend to get more disease problems. They also are, most of our native bees and bumblebees tend to work in um, more extended, more extended times, I guess, than, than some of the honeybees do, where they will be out when it's a little bit cooler, earlier in the morning, later in the day, and earlier in the season and later in the fall season when temperatures are cooler and those honeybees are not as active, our native bees will still be out pollinating. Again, many are solitary, so they don't form the colonies like honeybees do. 30% of our native bees are cavity nesting, so in hollow stems or wood. So again, to keep them living in your, in your garden area, leave any dead wood, or you can even build some bee hotels for your garden. And then 70% of them are ground nesting. So this, you again, want to leave some open areas for them to lay their eggs and, and build their nests in. So these are some of our native bees. The leaf cutter bee, often you will see, especially on roses and, and some of our other plants, you'll see circular cutouts around the edges of, of the leaves. And those are our leaf cutter bees. They use those leaves to, to line their nests with. The mason bee, this is one of our earlier bees that come out. Um, the mason bee and then the blue orchard bees. These I see all over my red buds. You know, my red buds are some of the earliest things to bloom in my yard and then they get covered with the mason bees and the blue orchard bees. The sweat bee, these are quite a bit smaller, but again, they're, they're great pollinators. Where our native bees are, they're more attracted to the pollen because they use the pollen to feed their young. Um, many of the honeybees are more for the nectar and then they just get the pollen by accident. Squash bees are a little bit bigger and, and they go right to those squash flowers. Sometimes these guys cheat and instead if it's a, a larger squash flower, they'll just cut a hole in the side of the flower and get some of the nectar and then they miss the pollen. Um, but you'll often find these in, in many of your squash plants. Carpenter bees will do the same thing. If it's a long tubular flower, sometimes you'll see a hole cut out at the base of that flower where they're just going for the nectar. Carpenter bees can be a problem in untreated wood. So um, if you're seeing damage on, on you know, fences or, or deck railings and such, um, you do want to get those out of there and, and then either paint or varnish that wood and that'll tend to keep them out of there. Bumblebees, we've got probably about 50 native bumblebee species in, in North America. And these again are ones that are out early pollinating and, and stay out later in the season. Um, and they're voracious pollinators for us. There are also those bee mimics. So there are drone flies. These, this is a bumblebee mimic on the, on the right side. And these are flies, even though they kind of have that protective look of, of looking like a bee. And then longhorn beetles, um, many of the beetle family, they, they don't have the hairy, the hairy bodies like the bees do to, to capture that pollen, but they've got kind of a like a sandpapery tongue that, that that's how they capture the pollen is they kind of scrape it off of the plant. These are leaf beetles and you'll see them in all shapes and sizes. Um, but again, they tend to, to find plants. This is a, an onion plant that they're on and they really like those smaller flowers that are in, in great clusters. Snout beetles, you'll find them in um, a wide variety of flowers. They're ones that can actually pollinate some of those deeper tubular flowers too. And then again, here's our soldier beetles. We saw those in the predators, but they're also great pollinators. And then our butterflies and moths. This is probably what we think of more when we, when we think of pollinators are the bees and the butterflies. Um, many of our native plant species are primarily pollinated by butterflies and moths. And the, the way they do that is the large butterflies brush their wings against the anthers. And so then that transfers the pollen grains to other plants that they visit. Now butterflies are not um, 
good at hovering when they pollinate. So they actually need kind of a landing platform on, on the plant. So they have a place to, to settle and then they do their pollination. Many of the caterpillars um, for butterflies and moths are generalist, but we do have some that are very specific to the plant hosts that they will feed on. And so these are some of the more common of our butterflies and then the host plants that their larvae need. So this is the painted lady and they tend to lay their eggs on sunflowers, hollyhocks and thistles. The cabbage white, anything in the cabbage family. Um, so cabbage, broccoli, radish, kohlrabi. The clouded sulfur, these prefer our legumes, so clover, anything in the bean family. So if you've got beans or peas growing or even alfalfa, this is what they lay their eggs on. The buckeye, they prefer plantains and snapdragons. And then swallowtails, this is one of the ones that, that many people try to attract. They only feed on plants in the, in the carrot family. So things like dill, parsley, fennel, and carrots. Morning cloak, this is one that actually feeds, their larva feeds on, on more of the tree plants rather than some of the smaller herbaceous plants. So willow, cottonwood, and elm are their larval host plants. Viceroy is another tree feeding larva, so willows and poplars. This is the one that mimics the monarch. The monarchs only feed off of milkweed, and so they get some um, compounds in their system that predators such as birds don't like. So even though the viceroy don't feed off of those same milkweed plants, they get that look, and so then birds, predators see them as being something undesirable to eat. The way to tell a viceroy from a monarch is the viceroy have this line on their, their lower wings there. And then these are the monarchs. Um, these are the ones that their larvae only feed on the milkweed family. And so you can tell the difference between um, males and females. The females tend to have thicker veins and then the males have the two spots on their lower wings. So when you're planting in your garden for insects, um, these are just a few things to keep in mind. Most of our insect friendly plants, they prefer sites that receive full sun throughout the day because we're wanting them to bloom. So usually six to eight hours of full sun. And then plant a wide variety of plants, not just um, types of blooms, types of flowers, but in the, in the timing that they bloom. So you want plants blooming from the start of the season to the end of the season because those insects need to feed throughout the whole growing season. Then habitat size and shape. So habitat patches that are larger and closer together are better than smaller isolated ones. So the larger in mass that you can plant, the better those insects one are going to find your garden, but then they don't have to travel quite as much as they're feeding. And then your planting layout. So flowers that are clustered into clumps of one species will attract more insects than individual plants scattered throughout a habitat. So again, you, know, you want diversity, but try and, and put a number of the same plants together within in that garden area. So when you're selecting your flowers, you want ones that provide nectar and pollen as alternative food, so food sources. Um, and the older, Varieties of those flowers are better than many of our um, newer ones, where the newer ones are, are bred more for, for color and, and that wow show factor, but often that's done at the expense of nectar and pollen. So it's nice to have those for the show, but include some of the older varieties, some of the heirloom varieties, because they do tend to have more nectar and pollen. If you're going with local plants, Try to get ones that are, are locally sourced, at least the seeds are locally sourced, um, because those are 
more adapted to our area and our insects here are more adapted to them as well. Again, plant your flowers in masses and then choose several colors of flowers and then select flowers that will provide blooms throughout the entire growing season. And again, more flower area, that's just more beneficial insects that you will have. So flowers that attract, po attract pollinators, again, they're ones that are full of nectar. They tend to be brightly colored with petals that are usually blue or white or yellow. Bees tend not to be able to see red. Um, so in that blue yellow range is much better. These tend to be sweetly aromatic or have a minty fragrance, again, because that means just more nectar that's provided. Um, open in the daytime for most of our insects, but include some of those that open at night. Usually those tend to be more of our lighter colored and white flowers because those are the ones that attract many of our moths. The flowers will provide, again, a landing platform. So if you're thinking, um, or some examples, I guess, would be something like yarrow that's got a nice wide flower head that the insects can land on as opposed to something like a columbine that, that kind of hangs down and then the insect has to hover to get to that nectar. Often they're symmetrical, so one side of the flower is a mirror image of the other. Flowers are often tubular with nectar at the base of the tube, but you don't want them so long that the insects can't get to that nectar. Then again, natives, because many of our beneficial insects that are native have evolved with those native plants in our area. So these are just real quickly some of the, the native plants that, that are great for attracting beneficial insects. And this is kind of what I mean by cluster flowers with a, a landing platform. This is the butterfly milkweed. And so you see a lot of flowers in one area, but it's got a great spot for an insect to just land on and sit and do its pollinating. This is spider milkweed. This is one that tends to bloom a little bit earlier than some of the milkweeds and it's not quite as showy because it's very low growing, um, but it's one of the earlier ones that come up. And so as those monarchs and other insects are, are looking for places to feed, this one is up and growing. Common milkweed, these tend to spread, so make sure you've got a good area for them, but this will attract a wide variety of, of insects. Aromatic aster, um, if you've ever smelled this, you, you understand where, where that, that name aromatic comes from. But this is one of the latest blooming flowers. So as many of our insects are, are trying to get stores up for that winter um, hibernation or even like butterflies that are traveling to the south, this is one of their last feeding sources. So it's a great one to plant for, for fall bloom. Wild bergamot or monarda. This is in the mint family, and many of our mints are great for providing nectar for our insects. This one can tend to spread a little bit. There are some varieties that are a little bit better behaved, um, but this is one that you'll find all kinds of insects on. Liatris, these are just starting to bloom now. And, and again, they're one of the later ones that that as other things are kind of slowing down blooming, the Liatris will, will come up and, and provide um, a food source for many insects. This one is Blue Star or Amsonia, and this is an early bloomer. And this comes in wide variety of, of heights and um, some even more of a fern type of leaf or very narrow leaf um, plant. But these provide a real pretty blue in the springtime and then a really nice yellow foliage in the fall. But again, these are an early bloomer that provides an early food source for insects. Cone flowers, many of the plants in, in the aster family are um, great for providing pollen and nectar. But just again, make sure that they're the natives and not some of our hybrid cone flowers because those tend to um, provide less pollen and less nectar, especially the double flowered hybrids where it's even harder to access the pollen and nectar in those. And this is the yellow one if you're wanting a little bit different than, than some of the purple pink cone flowers. This one is Golden Alexander. 
and it's a perennial, but it's a member of the parsley family. And so those small um, umbels of flowers, again, attract a wide variety of insects, but this is also one that the swallowtails will use for a larval food source, and it is a perennial. It does tend to kind of spread. Um, they can get pretty good size, but once mine are done blooming, I just, sometimes I'll just run it over with a lawnmower. Um, and then they come right back. So they are pretty easy to keep into control, but I do cut them back pretty good when they're getting a little bit rangy. This is stiff goldenrod and there's a uh, many types of goldenrod that, that you can plant. Um, again, these are late bloomers. So they're just starting to bloom now and they will go ahead and keep blooming through September and into October. These get covered with those soldier beetles um, as well as many other insects. So again, a late food source for, for, um, for our insects as they're needed. This is hoary verbane or verbena stricta. And this one I always see all kinds of butterflies on. And then iron plant. This one is just again starting to bloom now. So again, it's another late food source. Um, you know, often we have a lot of selection during the, the main part of the growing season, but thinking early and late um, to continue to provide food sources for our insects is important. Purple prairie clover. This is one that's in that, that bean or the, the clover family. And again, anything in that clover family is, is very attractive to bees and many of those smaller, um, like the parasitic wasps and many of the smaller predator insects. And so are the onion plants. If you, you know, this is a native prairie onion, that's a perennial, but even if you plant some onion or garlic in your garden and leave some there and let it go to bloom, you'd be amazed at the number of insects that are attracted to those blooms. So this is just a list of some of the plant families that attract beneficial insects. Um, it's a common knotweed, hoverflies, parasitic wasps, the composite or the aster family, um, clovers, buckwheat, flowering buckwheat, is, is great for a cover crop in your vegetable garden, um, but it's also great for planting or for attracting beneficial insects. Queen Anne's lace, again, it's got that, that large flower cluster. Um, this one is in the carrot family. Any of the mints are great for attracting predatory wasps. Our native grasses, we often don't think of those as um, blooming plants, but those flowers do attract quite a few of the beetles. Sweet alyssum is an early bloomer. It's an annual, but it is one that, that attracts many of our, um, our bee mimics and, and the predatory flies. Fennel is in that carrot family, but again, parasitic wasps and predatory wasps. And the sweet clover, again, for bees and, and many of the predatory wasps and, and flies. Whoops. And then wild buckwheat will be similar to the flowering buckwheat, and then yarrow for, for attracting lady beetles and parasitic wasps and bees. And so just some of the plants that are in some of these families. So for the carrot family, angelica, anise, that I plant um, this the common anise for in my garden and they're covered, as soon as they start blooming, they're covered with, with um, beneficial insects. Chervil, cilantro, dill, fennel, in the golden alexanders, lovage, and wild carrots. And then the daisy or the aster family, it's a blazing star, chamomile, cosmos, goldenrod, um, the Mexican sunflower, sunflowers, tansy, and yarrow. And again, this is just a short list. There are many other, other plants in these families. The cabbage family, broccoli, cabbage, candy tuft, mustards and the sweet alyssum is in the cabbage family as well. And again, like these and with the onions, you want them to, to go to bloom. So, you know, harvest your own crop, but again, this is part of that planting enough for yourself and, and for the insects. So leave some that, that you allow to go to flower too. And then the other way you can attract 
some of our native bees are the insect hotels. And this is just kind of a fun, you know, they'll find their own place to live if needed, but this is kind of just a fun thing to add to your garden and gives you a little bit of artwork in your garden if you want. Um, these provide nesting sites for many of our solitary bees and wasps, as well as overwintering sites for um, the bees and wasps and beetles and butterflies and moths. So you can use a wooden box or just an empty birdhouse. Um, you want something that will kind of protect um, those nesting sites. So if it's got a little bit of a roof on it, like, like a birdhouse does, and then use a wide variety of materials because those insects, those different insects need different size spaces for their nesting. So sticks, hollow reeds, pine cones, rocks, dried leaves, straw, et cetera, will work. So if you're doing it for um, the native bees, you can do some bee boards. So again, the sizes should be varied. Um, for leaf cutter bees, the drilled holes should only be about a quarter of an inch wide and two and a half to four inches deep. For mason bees, drill the holes that are about six inches deep and five sixteenths of an inch wide. And then try to space those holes at least three fourths of an inch apart and never drill entirely through the wooden blocks because then you're just creating a wind tunnel and then they don't get that protection. So that keep the back of the block solid. And then you, what you wanna do is face the opening to the east or the southeast. So that protects it from the, the afternoon sun. And then if you can secure it so it doesn't move in the wind you can get like little paper straws to use as liners, so it makes it a little bit easier to clean out. Um, or else once they're done nesting in the springtime and they've, they've left, you can take those down and clean them out and then put them back when it's time for them to start laying eggs again. And so these are just a few examples. And again, they're kind of just fun to, to have in your garden as a little bit of an art piece as well. But notice the different size holes. So that again will provide nesting sites for, for a variety of, of bees and other insects. And you can go all out depending on how much space you've got. But some people get very creative with these. So. And these are just a few resources. There's a lot of great information out there on um, attracting beneficial insects and, and putting them to work in your garden. The bees in your backyard is a great one on just the native bees in North America. And then the Xerces Society is one of my favorite places for information on, on pollinators and bees as well as other um, native insects. And so they've got a few books out, but you can also go to their website and get a lot of great information and they're at xerces.org is their website. So I hope this gives you a little bit of information and, and you start thinking about your gardening practices to, to attract insects rather than looking at insects as, as detrimental to your garden. And I think so we've got a little bit of time now to answer some questions. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Pam. That was excellent. Uh, we do have some questions, so I wanted to um, jump in and just give you a chance to reply to a few of these. Uh, let's start here right at the beginning. Um, we had a question about wasps and a question about um, are they really friendly? Are they beneficial? When do we fear the wasps? Most of the wasps, again, they're solitary, so they tend not to have a hive that they're defending like honeybees are. Um, so if you leave them alone to just do their thing, they tend to leave you alone. It's when you start pestering them, then, then they become a problem. So if you just let them be on your flowers, they, they usually won't bother you. Yeah, there are some that, um, and carpenter bees are this way, the cicada killer wasps, they will come check you out and make sure that you're not their competition or that you're, you know, invading their space as another carpenter bee as another um, wasp. But once they figure out that you're not one of them and you're not out to take their space, then they tend to leave you alone. Excellent. Yeah, great. So when we're talking about beneficials, um, sometimes the, the companion plants such as marigolds gets in, you know, uh, there's questions about that. So 
one of the questions, how beneficial are marigolds in preventing uh, harmful insects or, you know, how beneficial are they? Do you have any suggestions? Marigolds are pretty low on my list for, for attracting them for a couple of reasons. Um, when it takes a lot of marigolds to really get that, that um, quantity that's needed, but marigolds are one of the worst for attracting spider mites too. Um, so it can be done with marigolds, but I just think like some of those that I listed, they're just a whole lot better options than marigolds. So. Excellent. Yeah. So refer to that list. Yeah. I thought that was a good resource. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we've had a couple questions regarding how do, why do we consider, uh, so like an insect, like an assassin bug, how, why do we consider them beneficial if they also are going to consume other insects we consider beneficial? So, I mean, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the, many of these don't, don't care whether they're feeding on the good or the bad insects, um, but they tend to, to control more of the bad in a better way than if we go out and control them. And when we go and treat for, for um, you know, the pest type insects, then again, we end up killing many of the, the beneficial insects and that just makes the pest numbers skyrocket. And then, it, then that's when we start to see more damage and crop losses. Um, so they can usually kind of, you know, keep a balance between the good and the bad, but they tend to do more good as far as controlling the bad numbers than, than wiping out the good ones. So. Okay, thanks. So uh, <clears throat> one of the ways of dealing with insects sometimes folks use is that stiff stream of water, you know, kind of a, a hard stream to, to mm -hmm. knock off aphids or mites, but is spraying the plants with strong water or a stream of water to remove aphids also going to remove beneficials and their eggs? Do you have any thoughts on that? It can, and, and yeah, it will. One of the ways that that really does the harm to the insects or to the aphids is they've got that feeding tube in that plant and that strong stream of water knocks them off and it breaks off that feeding tube so they can't continue to feed where yeah, you're going to damage a few of those beneficial insects, but you're not breaking off their body parts as much as you are the aphids, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I've had a couple folks that are looking for resources for identification, and so we may have to find. I I wasn't aware of any identification for like insect eggs. I mean, that was a question that came up. If we knew of any resource for identifying insect eggs or um, even uh, butterflies resources, and I think we do have some of those, but um, you're not aware of anything that like that, are you? I didn't know, but. Online bugguide.net is really good. Um, it's, it's actually professional entomologists that, that do the identification on those. And so they're very good about if you send in um, pictures and you know, send in the best quality pictures that you can and what plants you're finding them on and, and try and give an idea of, of you know, the scale or the size of those eggs. And that's probably the most legitimate resource, general resource that's out there for, for identification. Okay, excellent. Um, <clears throat> do you know of any uh, insects or beneficials that control Japanese beetles? Some of those larger ones that, um, yeah, the, the Japanese beetles come out in droves, so it's a little bit harder to control, you know, those that, that come out in large numbers, but some of those larger ones that feed off of the, the beetles, like the assassin bugs and, and some of those predatory wasps, but also those ones that feed off the insect eggs um, are a good way to start controlling them. Okay, excellent. Uh, do you have any suggestions or thoughts on a cultivars of flocks and their benefits for pollinators are beneficial, so cultivated varieties of the flocks? Yeah, specific varieties, no. Um, if you can go with some of those older varieties, the ones that have the better scent, those tend to have um, more nectar in them, though. Okay, yeah, so trend towards older or even the native flocks and, and go with yeah. those, yeah. Yep. Okay, um, so it, is there, 
another question regarding to those bit, those plants that attract pollinators. Is there a good pollinator flowering or an annual that you can plant in your vegetable gardens that you think would be a good addition for beneficials? Um, um, yeah, in your vegetable garden, again, the onions are great. Some of the mints, um, the anise hyssop probably attracts the most insects and the widest variety of insects in my garden. Um, sweet alyssum, I like to plant early in the spring. They kind of poop out when it gets a little bit hot, but then some of those others are, are blooming. But again, just let some of your vegetables go to flower and that will help too. Excellent, yeah, yeah, agree with that. Um, the, uh, so a question on cicadas, are they beneficial or do you classify them as a beneficial insect? Or can they damage plants? Yeah. They can They can do some damage, but again, usually not so much that, um, unless we get, you know, the, those locust invasions like like the olden days, um, they, they can do some damage with their feeding, but they also lay their eggs in the branches. And sometimes that can cause some harm, but usually our cicada killer wasps tend to take care of those. I mean, those are those great big wasp looking guys that they will come buzz you and, and check out who you are, but um, it's kind of neat to watch them because they will they will pick off those cicadas pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, excellent. That's fun. Yeah, it's a fun one to catch if you can see it. Yeah. Um, so are there, um, this re regarding cucumber beetles, do you know of pests that eat cucumber beetles or are we kind of at a loss and have to kind of handle those with other means? I get, you know, it's it's a a full scale attack you want to do on those. So again, you know, do some scouting when you see the eggs, you know, collect those eggs, but um, or destroy those eggs, I guess. But you know, again, some of those those soldier beetles, some of the predatory wasps, they will tend to go after those. Um, and the spiders too. I didn't mention spiders, but I always have those great big garden orb weaving spiders in my garden and. And they tend to eat quite a bit as well. So, yeah, that's a good reminder. It's time of year we're we're seeing those all over yeah. the place now. It's fun to watch. So, uh, okay. So, uh, what about uh, cleaning up? Um, some discussion on these beneficial insects and pollinators, and how we handle cleanup or the end of the year. You know, in our gardens, even vegetable gardens versus flower garden. How do we? What's the balance of cleanup versus leave habitat? Yeah. yeah. If you've had insect pest problems or disease problems, I usually just get that out of there because that, you know, you know that that's a source for, for the problems. But if you can leave an area and it doesn't have to be right there in your vegetable garden, but it can be off to the side a little bit further away or maybe by a compost pile or something and leave some of that litter and then you know, in the flower garden, try not to cut off too much in the fall. Um, th this is my excuse for being lazy in the fall and not doing cleanup because many of those insects, like the stems of um, the milkweed or even the echinacea flower stems, many of those hollow stems is where they will overwinter and lay their eggs. So, you know, if you can leave those through the fall and winter, that gives them a site to overwinter. But then even in the springtime, you know, clean that up as, as new things are starting to emerge, but set them aside in a pile and leave them there for a little bit. So as those eggs hatch and that larva tends to emerge, they're, you know, they're not destroyed, but they're kind of out of the way so that they can still come out and, and do some good. Excellent. Uh, question on, you know, some of these other, maybe in a lawn situation more so where we're dealing with chiggers or these different pests, is there a way to deal with those without harming bees and beneficials? Um, that usually is more of a cultural issue, especially the chiggers and, and even some of the ticks and the, and the mosquitoes. So you don't want to give them breeding ground. So yeah, don't let your lawn stay wet for long periods of time and, and don't let it get too, too tall. You know, you, you don't want it, cut it too short that you're harming it in the summertime, but but you know, keep it mowed properly and keep it healthy, and, and that tends to to reduce some of that those problems. Um, is is a better way to do it than than just generally spraying. Excellent. 
this uh, <clears throat> little bit of curiosity about the uh, army worms that have been out here a little bit recently. It, do you have uh, any predators or know of anything that, that helps control those? Or is that kind of one of those all at once things that happens that we kind of have to respond to at times? Yeah, and this year it's probably one of those times that we need to give them a little extra help. You know, we have army worms every year, but but it's just every once in a while that they they come out and it's just kind of, you know, the convergence of the weather and, and the growing situation and, and how many of those emerge that we really see damage with them. And this is one of those years. Um, you know, most years I don't get very many calls on army worms. This year is making up for that. And, and so when it when it's large numbers like that, sometimes, you know, now's the time to where we need to step in. But but you can do use products that contain the BT. And that's one that only attracts or that only attacks um, those in the caterpillar family. So um, you know, using something like that will not harm our bees or, or beetles or other insects. Okay, excellent. Um, there's one more, uh, at least uh, one question here regarding, uh, I, I'm trying to interpret here, leave, uh, do you leave leaves until spring um, if you compost, uh, you know, or what's the, what do you suggest with leaves and beneficials? Do you till them in in the fall or leave things and then, you know, try to deal with that in the spring or any suggestions? Um. Yeah, it kind of depends on your practices, but again, this is the, you know, leave some for them, use some for you. So, you know, if you're one that likes to work that in in the fall and then you work it into the soil in the fall and have it broken down by planting time next spring, that's fine. You know, that's great for the soil and that's a great way to do it, but but just, you know, leave some aside too for, for the insects as well. It doesn't okay. have to be all or nothing one way or the other. Yeah, no, that's that's a good good response. Um, the uh, for a new gardener here that says, you know, they're looking for maybe some resources to, okay, I just need to get familiar with the beneficials. What are they? Um, do we uh, do you recommend? Uh, you you mentioned a, a website earlier. Do you have any other recommendations on where they can go look for? Um, and I suppose we can even post some links to for this. Yeah. But, um, that Xerces Society is a great place to start if you're just wanting to learn general insects. That bugguide.net um, is really good as well. Colorado State University, um, Whitney Crenshaw has some some good information on gardening with beneficial insects as well and attracting them to your garden. Okay, excellent. And I also had found one from the Missouri Botanical Garden as well. If, they, if folks want to look that one up, that's a great resource too. We could maybe post a link. So yeah, there's multiple great resources for learning those. Um, and so I think in the essence of time here, um, I think we've covered the majority or the, the, the themes, the big themes that we've had for questions. So yeah, thanks, Pam. Great presentation. We'll kind of turn it back over to Cassie and let her close us out. All right, sounds good. So if we didn't get to your question, um, make sure to go look at the website. We'll have links to several articles related to the session um, and more resources that will answer your questions. So once again, thank you for joining us for K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We're glad you could be here today to learn about beneficial insects. We have several interesting sessions coming up in our fall and winter series. So be sure to check out our K-State Garden Hour website to see all of those topics. This session was recorded and will be posted on our website tomorrow afternoon. After the webinar ends today, you will receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill that out. We would really appreciate your feedback. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to gardenhour at ksu.edu. Thanks again for coming and we hope you continue to tune in for our first and third Wednesdays of each month. Have a great week.